I actually think it's crucially important to think that there are things that we can know. There is such a thing as absolute truth. I think all truth is actually absolute. And there are things that we can know with a kind of definitive certainty. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can formulate it uh, quantitatively, say, or, or give it the, it's, 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 it's certain, but it still requires our participation and our involvement. Would you be able to speak about philosophy, uh, how it was done in ancient times, or maybe the ancient meaning of it, and then how philosophy is done in academia today, and the contrast between the two? Yeah, that's, that's a, it's a big question, but it's a good, it's a good one to start with. I mean, I, you know, I think a lot of people find philosophy intimidating, um, when you think of it as a, as a rigorous academic discipline, um, there's a great deal of training required to be taken seriously. And, and in order to uh, present an argument, one, one needs to demonstrate um, mastery of, of uh, secondary literature and, and scholarship and so forth. But if, it's, it's pretty straightforward to say it di didn't begin that way, obviously. Um, uh, I mean, even the, the, the phenomenon of the academy and the university is, a, is fairly late in, in human history. Uh, in the beginning, the, I mean, the, 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 the heart of it is, is, as the word itself says, the love of wisdom. And um, it, it began with uh, a desire to understand the world that we live in. So the, it was immediately connected to life. You didn't ask questions simply as puzzles to, to sort through, um, but, but because of, a, of an interest in, in living in a profound way. Um, the nature, responding to the nature of things, and and, and having a, a a life of of substance, um, the the kind of academic disputes, uh, um, you know, if you look through the the, the, the history, um, the the roots of those uh, that that kind of thing, where 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 uh, philosophy becomes more of a professional discipline, the the um, forebears there are not so much the philosophers as they are the sophists um, who were the professional teachers in Plato's in Plato's day and uh, they acquired a certain reputation because um, the and this is the big question really you know what is it that motivates your reflection um, is it a certain kind of success or a certain kind of prestige these sort of extrinsic considerations or is it genuinely a desire to get to the truth of things? And that's, you know, that's a ba basic question that actually affects every single human being who lives has to um, answer that question, whether through, you know, explicitly through reflection or just the way you live, you're going to be answering that question. Um, and, you know, in Plato's terms, that means that every one of us has to grapple with this question, are we going to be philosophical? Or are we going to be sophistical? <laughs> that's, uh, mm. that's a basic human human question. Interesting. It's and again, that kind of makes you think that yeah, in a way, anyone can be a philosopher. Though you know, maybe and maybe sometimes um, we must. You, you know, the reason I asked that that question is that the first question is that I was recently listening to a podcast with a philosopher, Daniel Dennett, mm -hmm. and he talks about how he he was. At one point, hearing students, you know, graduate students in philosophy say that they did philosophy because they didn't have to know anything about the world. They could just be smart <laughs> and they could and they could, um, you know, go through argumentation and then they'd be able to pass. Um, and, and he thought, you know, that was kind of antithetical to what it, what it means um, to to be a philosopher. But in that sense, in some academic settings, it, it can be like that. I mean, I. I even think about the nature of uh, of language itself, um, and and it's something you touch on in your work, how knowledge, uh, in a way, is is different. The human experience and perspective is different from even the knowledge that we could write down and that that could be transferable between people. So I don't know if you'd be, have anything to say on that clash. Yeah, that's uh, the. Let me let me set aside the language thing for for a moment. That's a huge question. We can come back to that. But I I want to touch on something that you had mentioned in our uh, brief conversation before we got started. Um, the role of uh, friendship in philosophy. Um, that um, 
when 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 we reduce philosophy to uh, just argumentation, um, then you know how do you how do you know whether you're good at arguing? It's it's whether you win arguments. You see, it becomes immediately com combative and competitive, and the point isn't so much uh, the intrinsic one of acquiring insight or wisdom or understanding. The the point is the extrinsic one of achieving a certain uh, success and, and vic victory in, in, in argument. And uh, those are fundamentally different things. It seems to me, um, you know, Plato's always the model, but, uh, always for me, but I think in generally, uh, in general for philosophy. Um, in, in the Republic, he, he makes a very clear point that uh, a, a proper pursuit of a basic question by its very nature, insofar as it's interested in getting to the heart of a matter, um, if that's if that's in fact the governing principle of the activity, then it's going to be open to everything that will help that occur, and um, the the participation of others is a, is a natural correlate. Um, you 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 want to disclose the truth of something. That's something that you both need help. Uh, from others to achieve, and you recognize from the beginning that the outcome is not the private possession as it would be in a, comp a competitive uh, scenario. The, the, the goal is not private possession. The goal is the manifestation of truth, and that's a public thing. That's a communal thing. That's something that we share by its nature. You know, and, and that makes me think about a theme that I've found from meeting you, uh, which is that perhaps knowledge uh, and truth can't be a private thing right. if, if it is to, to say something true about the world. And I even think about theories in cognitive science, such as distributed cognition, and that in a way we're not actually thinking and comprehending the world by ourselves, but we're using others and technologies to understand it. And that um, to think that we could understand the world by ourselves uh, is kind of folly. And, you know, as you say about getting to the heart of, of matters, I don't see how you could do that um, through, with, 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 not that you can't argue because, because actually I recently found that with one of my closest friends, as soon as he takes up a position as we're talking, I instantly take up the opposite position, but it's not, it's not to beat him. Right. It's just because if he's going to take one position and be boring to side with him instantly, okay. let's take the opposite, opposite position, but then let's see where we can go from there. Yeah. And, and often it builds to something more true and more interesting. Oh, absolutely. And there, there's no problem at all in dispute, but as you say, the, the point, and that's why I was emphasizing, what is the end goal? What is, what is in fact the, the organizing principle that, that governs the activity? If it's insight, it's going to invite dispute because because by its very nature, and this, this connects with your, your point about uh, distributed cognition, uh, that, that uh, by its very nature, as you know, embodied knowing is, is perspectival. It's something we can't help but have a particular angle on something that's going to be different from the angle that another person has, uh, whether that be a next door neighbor or someone from a different culture. And, and th that in itself actually opens up, makes clear that, that um, uh, there's going to be a certain tension maybe, but the, the tension can be productive. It can be, it can be the, the, the sort of rubbing together, uh, of sticks, as Plato says, that generates the spark of, of, of insight. Um, but the, again, the point is, you know, is, is, is insight the aim or is victory the aim? Um, and that, that changes, that changes everything. Another dimension that comes up here is the moment you recognize that, that truth has this sort of public shared character, you begin to recognize the importance of the political dimension and the social dimension. Um, that that uh, philosophy can never really successfully be in. well can never I'd probably qualify that uh, um, you know some some circumstances force people to pursue it in a in a as a as a lonely individual but that's certainly not the ideal or the essence of the matter um, it's it's naturally a, a, a social re, a political reality. 
Mm. I've recently been looking into a lot of and just thinking about like theories in physics. Like, can we get like a mathematical theory of everything that, or even our models of physics at the moment? We write down our equations and we we have a model and we think like this is true to reality. Um, do you think that philosophy could ever have that kind of goal? Like, so you talk about you know we we get insight, but is it is it possible that is philosophy the kind of field that would have yeah. a theory of everything? Like, actually, we've 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 done all the insight. We've really we've talked things through, and so we're we're better philosophers. But mm-hmm. could we write down something um, yeah. concrete that would be fine, or is it always going to be something where we need to keep thinking about things? Would there ever be a final end that, state? Yeah, th- that's that's a big question, and it's a, it's it's a more delicate and subtle question than we tend tend to realize. Um, we tend to think that there are uh, we, we, we we tend to fall into a false dichotomy that either we can um, formulate something in an explicit statement that's definitive and and resolves the problem so that no more thinking is required um, or it doesn't and all we have are interpretations and discussions and we, we sort of um, spin our wheels in empty space and, and don't get anywhere and it seems like those are the alternatives but but in fact those are those are much more um, recent alternatives if I can put it that way um, and this is why I, I find the question of what is the nature of truth such a fascinating question because the way you interpret the nature of truth is going to affect your judgment on, on, on these sorts of things if you think of, of truth as something like um, uh, an objectively real space that you that you enter into, um, you're you're going to see that that um, it 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 doesn't make sense to think that it's something that you formulate in a final statement. You realize it's something that that you you have to become present to. Um, you you have to go out of yourself. You it, it, uh, uh, and join with others. In fact, um, in a, in a way that 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 uh, abides. There's no there's no. Def- you know, it doesn't. It doesn't have to to have a definitive ending, um, but that doesn't make it. That's that's precisely because it is objective. It's not. It's not um, uh, a threat to the objectivity of truth. It's something we indwell. To use uh, the language of um, Michael Pliny, a very interesting uh, uh, philosopher from the last century, um, we ind- indwell the truth, and and uh, if that's the case, then. Um, you know that this false dichotomy falls away. I actually think it's crucially important to think that there are things that we can know. There is such a thing as absolute truth. I think all truth is actually absolute, and there are things that we can know with a kind of definitive certainty. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can formulate it uh, quantitatively, say, or or give it. Def- it's it's it, it's it's certain, but it still requires our participation and our involvement. And 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 it's st- and it and it still um, uh, yields a kind of inexhaustible fruit of reflection and and uh, ever deeper insight. It's interesting. I mean, would you say that we can never really have or or just acquire truth? Um, so so this, I mean, uh, but also you know, you're saying okay, it's, it's objective, but mm-hmm. but we can also get it's beyond us but we can get into it it's funny because i mean because i again i've i've been grappling with um philosophers thinking about you you know can we actually ever get to and touch truth uh, and touch reality um and you know you could take a position where it's it's all it's all in us anyway it's just subjectivity in which case we kind of have it but then it's a kind of isolated one that's Mm -hmm. maybe not that valuable or reasonable anyway but then if it's so if it's beyond us how do we ever get to it and then I'm just what I'm hearing is kind of like a, a synergy between the two. Well, we it's we're still yeah. us. We can, but right. we can so, get to something beyond us. Exactly. I mean, think about it. It's 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 like swimming in the ocean. You know, you you enter into it, and and you it's not that you're you remain. I mean, but it, you would never say that it's yours. You would never say that that um, you've somehow captured it. Uh, I mean, precisely the contrary contrary your experience of entering into the ocean is entering into something that's infinite and vast but at the same time you have absolutely no doubt that you are wet 
<laughs> you are completely immersed in it. There's there's no there's no doubt there. Um, uh, in fact, the certainty is uh, of being wet uh, uh, coincides with this opening to the infinity of the of the reality. So so it's the, the, the question is is whether we possess whether whether we can capture truth as a possession, a private possession. And I would say no, but that doesn't uh, call into question its certainty. That doesn't call into question its objectivity. It's, it's um, uh, trustworthiness, it's reliability. To the contrary, it, 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 um, uh, it's precisely why um, our participation in it is so, is so certain. And so, um, um, yeah. Um, trustworthy hmm i i suppose i kind of want to unpack a bit then what truth is uh, mm -hmm. and how we get to it and how we're how we even call to it um mm -hmm. so you know in your in your books in your work you, you 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 talk about the relation between truth beauty and love and and i definitely think talking though about first truth and uh, it's so important in our world today where you know we are and particularly technologies are sort of uh, confronting us that sort of a warping truth. And right. so it is hard to know what is true. So it's not even just a kind of individual level. It's no, actually what is true is a huge question. And so maybe trying to think about how we can get to genuine truth and, and if other things like beauty and other transcendentals come into that, then that would be interesting too. So, you know, what, where do you think we could begin to try and understand? Like, because it, it's, 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 it's strange if truth is beyond us, and and even the the claim that we can't have a private truth, and it's still even that to me, I'm I'm still wondering why that 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 can't be the case. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, the question is is to come back to it is is what what we're looking for. You know, what what would count as insight? Um, you know, is it is it something that can't possibly be refuted in any respect? And and it, it seems to me that that's not what we what we tend to mean by by truth, naturally speaking. I mean, no, but nobody, you know, is it true that the world? So here, here's a here's a simple example. Let, let, let me say first of all, um, I think that that uh, we can't but know the truth. I mean that 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 that. Uh, uh, it's impossible not to have some grasp of reality, um, um, even to raise questions about it. We're prompted to raise questions because of real things. I mean, it's always too late when we start to raise skeptical doubts. We're uh, we're already committed, and and so coming to to grasp truth is not achieving something that, that we don't yet have. It's actually recognizing that we've always already. Um, committed ourselves in some basic way. Now, that doesn't mean it's irrefutable. So, for example, um, you know, the question, uh, uh, I'm sitting here before a desk and I'm touching this desk, you know, is this desk real? Um, uh, one might say that um, I could, you know, there are all sorts of skeptical questions that I could raise about it. Um, um, you know, I could, I, it's possible that my brain is sitting in a, in a jar in some mad scientist workshop and, and these experiences are being produced in me. I mean, you can raise all sorts of skeptical questions. Um, um, but that doesn't, that, um, the, the fact of being able to raise skeptical questions to my mind doesn't call into question the reliability of it. Um, uh, uh, and th this, this gets sort of subtle, but, um, and this is why I said that you know the question is what we're looking for, what sort of criterion are, are we are we searching for? Um, Ar Aristotle makes a very wise point, which is that um, the idea that something ought to be admitted only if it can be proven demonstratively um, is itself. First of all, you can't you can't prove that that's required. I mean, you can turn the you can turn the table on the skeptic. Um, uh, uh, why, you know, what is it that makes you think that only things that can be proven, can you prove to me that only things that can be proven ought to be accepted? Of course you can. Um, so you can turn the table, but, but, the, but the, the, um, the other more positive point, which I think is, a, is really an evident one is that, um, 
we uh, that that um, it's precisely the things that are most evident that are are let, let, let me put it this way demonstration depends on um, some accepting something as, as as evident so you 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 found your demonstration you you have to you, you give reasons based on uh, uh, something that's already evident it it doesn't it doesn't make sense that you would um, prove something less evident on the base on, or sorry prove something that's more evident on the basis of something that is less evident mm. make more sense to begin with what we sort of take for granted what, what we uh, what we see to be true and the the experience that there's a real world out there is something that we just simply see to be true um, and uh, it's 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 seen with a kind of a self-evidence we don't we don't argue to it. Um, uh, we argue from it, you might say, rather than to it. But we, we see it to be true. And and the, the most fundamental truths are going to have that character, something that you simply, uh, that, that is evident of itself rather than as the conclusion of a proof. So mm -hmm. I, that, was a, that was a little complicated, uh, my, my explanation. I'm not entirely happy with how I put all of that. But I, but I hope the point is clear. Yeah, that that's really good. I mean, I, you know, but I, w I would say to, to play the skeptic a mm -hmm. bit more. I mean, I do, I, I first I would just acknowledge I really do like that um, we, the truth comes, there's a perspective we must come from in the first place to start right. questioning it. And it's something that I talked to you about with a philosopher, John Rusin, on the topic of free will, that mm -hmm. to just to ask a question about something kind of, it's already presupposing a person asking that question. Right. Um, but but I would, and I really like that you bring up, imagine if the true reality though is something like your brain in a jar and this is a, a simulated kind of reality that in some way is less real than, than that reality. Um, I still don't, I think I'm thinking about that a lot because I've been looking into, you know, wild theories of physics, like, you know, what if um, we just have no idea like what the actual true nature of reality is. Um, I, and I think surely that would call into question because are we then not actually understanding a true reality, even if this is as close to it as we can get. So I'm still kind of unsure as to, as to what that says about whether we can actually touch reality. Yeah. If, if, yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, so t two things there is, is one, um, if one wanted to be really rigorous about those kinds of questions, one would have to investigate the, what are the presuppositions um, uh, behind the question. So, I mean, it's analogous to the point that you made about you know you you already presuppose a person who's asking the question. I mean, what are what are the basic presuppositions that gen that that make um, potentially compelling a skeptical question? And whether those basic presuppositions, what are the warrant for those? Um, why accept those rather than the ones that, you know, um, Aristotle and 99.9% .9 of the human population accepts, you know, um, uh, uh, and, and measure those. So that's, that's, that's one dimension. The, the, the other is, is um, you know, if, if it's the case that reality is different from what we perceive to be uh, real, um, that uh, at some point for, for us to be able to find out that what we think is true is not, um, can only itself occur on the basis of some insight. So, so, e so even to correct a, a view requires some, some actual experience of, 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 of what's true. And, it, and if you say, well, it's possible that there's absolutely nothing that could possibly falsify our, our, our judgments, then that, that's, that amounts to saying that it's totally irrelevant, actually. Um, you know, if it, if it, if it has so little to do with, with, um, any, any possible experience, then, 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 you know, and this is, this why, this is why for me, it comes back to the original sorts of question. 
then you ask, well, what is it? What, why would you even raise a question about that? And what are the foundations? What are the presuppositions that prompt that? And why are those more compelling than the alternative? Mm, it's interesting that you bring up what would allow us to change our, our view uh, that there is, we, we must have some connection to the real and the true because the, the world is intelligible to, to to ask a question even i mean we're kind of also if we if we say something is illusory right. uh, i think as well you kind of have to have something that's more true than right. it to, to say that it's illusion compared to but if there's nothing true in the first place then then uh then it doesn't if, even make sense to say that it's all illusion that that that, that mm. doesn't make sense but the very fact that we understand that sentence mean i mean just just our grasp of that sentence means that that it's not true I think it was in your book and G.K. Chesterton talking about, I mean, okay, start with the world being an illusion or say it's all a joke, fair enough. But then if that's your grounding, then does that change what things like love and beauty are? It's okay, you're calling that a joke, but yeah. but then it's, but is that, would you just have to change your meaning of what that is so much? Yeah. Is that it? Yeah. Yeah, no, and I, and I think the, the point, and uh, this is, um, this is why the the skeptical questions always end up at a certain level being parlor games. It's just something that you know one wants to you know cause trouble, you know mischief making. I mean, the fact of the matter is, um, no human being could ever possibly uh, embrace that position. It's I mean, it's just simply impossible. And in fact, um, you never encounter. I mean, the fact of caring about anything. Um, even even desiring to prove that the world has no meaning uh, is founded in some basic desire that you know that 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 would make that a shocking statement. So I mean that you know that that our commitment to the meaningfulness of reality is so fundamental to who we are as human that um, uh, uh, to you know. To, 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 to make it a joke is itself a joke and it's and it's it, it only touches the surface it's it's very interesting because interesting mm -hmm. because the that skeptical position you might logically your words might be uttering the fact that you're a skeptic but mm -hmm. then in a performative way the way you're acting to your desires in why you're saying things in the first place must be different to what kind of your, what your words say yeah. uh, because otherwise yeah, um, and there's, it happens all the time. Even, I wonder if this is related, if people like Sam Harris, when they talk about things that like we don't have free will, uh, we have no free will at all, but then they don't act like they do. And sure. and sometimes that's, that's that that must, I just wonder why that doesn't change what your, your views of it are. But, but maybe, maybe that's a general question I could ask, because I do think about that sometimes too. I mean, could we be tricked into, we think we have free will, <laughs> um, but... Yeah, yeah. I mean, and uh, that's why I say um, um, I don't. I don't think that these basic claims that I'm making are irrefutable. I just don't think that irrefutability is the proper standard for acceptance of what's true. Um, uh, and 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 in fact, I don't think anybody actually thinks that. In fact, it's impossible to think that. Um, so so all of us again begin with certain commitments and the and that very fact it's not that I'm, I want to then absolutize whatever commitments we happen to, to begin with I just want to point out the fact that that that's a that's universal and that even those who who refute all of that don't actually live that way or act that way um, as a professor of mine once once paraphrased uh, Aristotle um, you know, for, for, for anyone to, to reject meaning altogether, um, that, that, that person is effectively a, 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 a vegetable and you can't argue with, uh, you can't argue with a vegetable, but of course you don't need to. <laughs> and I mean, that's, that's, that's basically the point. I mean, if people care about something, it's not even just about what you, so this is, this is why I, um, I, 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 um, one of the first books that I wrote, um, and it still remains, I think, my favorite, is on, on Plato's Republic. And 
I begin with a discussion of these kinds of things. It's, it seems to me it's it's helpful to switch the register from pure logic to the order, the, the, the dramatic and existential order of the good and recognize that there are things that we care about. Um, and that those that, that, you know, so that, that to care about some, you know, logic, if you simply remain in the realm of logic, you can, you can spin all sorts of theories. You know, this is why there's a disconnect between somebody who, who sort of, you know, proves that the world doesn't exist, but doesn't live that way. The reason that there's a disconnect is that um, the order of the good uh, necessarily involves our commitment. Necessarily, it's we 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 pursue things that are good. We we can't help but come out of ourselves into the into the world. Whereas in pure logic, we can we can sort of contentedly stay within ourselves. But in the order of the good, we we move out into the world. This is why Plato makes goodness. I I argue anyway makes goodness the the ultimate cause of even truth because uh the the truth of things requires our um commitment to them in some sense um and therefore an or an entry into this we we have to care about reality and we we do we we can't but care about reality is this making sense you see i mean mm -hmm. asking about what people care about is more interesting to me than asking whether they think that this desk here exists or not yeah that that people could you know spin the wheels of logic and their words and then their thoughts but like so that's one reality but then the reality of what they do uh, is different and if that doesn't correspond then it kind of yeah undermines what they're saying and and I, yeah i'm very interested if we could explore how in a way i mean it's making sense to me that good kind of has to come before uh truth um and and also that maybe there's a kind of a, a receptivity like how we were talking about with with right. friendship right. where if if truth just isn't isn't just logical statements then we have to let let it come to us yeah. it's outside of us and we have to let it uh, itself draw us in and so there must be something that leads us to that and so yeah yeah no this is i uh, i've been um giving much more thought lately to the role of beauty in that. I mean, I think that's precisely where beauty enters into the picture. It's, 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 you know, prior to it's, it's the initiating relationship. We, we, um, uh, Hunter, this, this theologian, uh, Catholic theologian, Hunter's from Balthazar talks about the, the mother's smile that awakens the child to consciousness so that the, the, the very original acts of consciousness are being called forth from the child by a, a look of love that isn't isn't um, in the first place satisfying a desire, but a simple uh, but a presentation uh, radiating forth a kind of um, affirmation, uh, and that that's that experience is what initiates consciousness. Now, notice you're being struck by you're being you're being solicit your your attention is solicited by the presence of something that you don't expect. It doesn't simply, you know, it, it takes you and it's some basic way by surprise. And that, that draws you in. Then, then the good and the true sort of start to um, unfold and, 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 and uh, you know, crystallize according to their proper order. Mm, it's so interesting that, that love is prime primary in that sense, in that you, when you, when you have no, perception as you're first like born as a child of what it is mm -hmm. you can't desire it but right. as it's presented to you it's it just it naturally it's it tra attracts you or it's just it's there you see it and and it pulls you towards consciousness so even trying to understand the world but that comes from that initial point of something being receptive to you as an agent yeah no and it's it's amazing that that um I, you know i was just reading uh, a, a study um in psychology uh, yesterday, uh, you know, it's amazing. A, a newborn child within um, uh, within the first 45 minutes of its existence will already focus on a face and try to imitate. If you make if you make faces, if you stick your tongue out, already within the within the first moments of the child's existence, you know. So 
the child's not responding, you know, and, and the thing is, why would, why should that happen? That that's an extraordinary thing. Why is it that the child already associates its own, obviously not consciously and, and deliberately, but it, the very, it, its own movements are responsive to what it sees. And it recognizes that look from the face of the other as, as significant, more significant than just the table that it's lying on or, or the air, you know, that there's something that draws the child in and already communicates a kind of an order um, to the child right at the beginning. I mean, that's extraordinary to me. Mm. And you mentioned love there, and you also yeah. talk about, you're trying to think more about beauty. And, and just to say something from, from reading your, your, your work about beauty, which is that you could even argue that it's a reflection of what is true in the world like something the more true the more the more being more more true it is the yeah. the, the the more like beauty tells us how beingness something is i mean i think i just it's 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 striking and great but also a bit weird because it makes me think like are ugly things uh, less in a way like true to reality and that kind of kind of sounds weird if we take a view of like us i mean Maybe a materialism where it's like surely there are just concrete things, but 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 maybe beauty actually does call us to try and see and understand reality. Yeah, yeah no, that's why that's why I um uh, a, a notion that just you know every day my appreciation for this notion increases. Um, the notion of analogy, the importance of it in thought, is just overwhelming. But um, if you think of beauty analogously, that 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 anything that solicits your attention has something beautiful about. It. There's something striking about it, even even if it's ugly, but it solicits your attention. Um, but that doesn't mean that all things are equally beautiful. It, se it seems to me that it's important to recognize that we have. I mean, this is why you know the smile of the mother on the newborn. Why that experience is actually a fundamental one, because it becomes its orient. Uh, it orients consciousness. Um, uh, you begin with this original affirmation um, that opens up your mind to, to the real. And and uh, you know what what is the mother doing when she smiles on the child? She's telling the child that the child is good. It's good for the child to be, and that in her smile she's actually. Um, welcoming the child into the world. So the child has this experience of being invited in. Um, uh, uh, and that, that kind of gives the background ethos for the whole experience. Now, of course, not every child has that. Um, uh, uh, I think it's probably rare that, that, that a child has absolutely no experience of ever having been smiled at. I mean, to, to my mind, that would be a that, that's hard to imagine, though I, I do imagine that it happens, um, uh, that there's not someone or some, something that, that, that affirms the child. Um, but but uh, that shows us why, why, to the extent that something like that exists, it really is tragic because it affects, I mean, as psychologists, well, well, developmental psychologists, um, these, these, to have a traumatic experience at the very beginning of consciousness will affect one's whole life. You know, um, and by contrast, to have a positive experience actually affects one's whole life. And I think that that we, we recognize that it's it's more proper <laughs> to be affirmed as a child than to be denied and rejected. And that that tells us something more real. So so that the you see how beauty does have a kind of a normativity in this in this regard, um, even though that saying that doesn't mean that um it's universal in a kind of generic sense or that all things are equally beautiful or, or that, you know, you see what I'm saying? There are degrees of beauty. Mm. Um, uh, things can be, uh, uh, can betray beauty. Um, um, you know, there's a whole range of possibilities. And I really like that you bring up the psychological fact that in our development, to the degree that we kind of are, loved or experienced beauty that changes how we then go on to see and understand the world later on i mean to, to anyone who tries to think and 
view truth as something which are just facts that we take in as as nuggets and like right. and it's just our sense it's just our it's it's just created like say in our minds um and there's no direct connection to the world it's like what like in a <laughs> performative way these children are changed they yeah. are different yeah. um because of this it's not it's not arbitrary um even even if in, we might it may seem a bit more like that if we're as an adult just experiencing art um and we, we may say oh well well i mean this versus that what does it matter and that makes me think <laughs> taking this strong view of yeah. the importance of love and beauty maybe art and beauty in our own lives actually does change mm-hmm. how we act and how we understand the world uh, more than we think um that would be a very interesting perspective to think about yeah Um, yeah i i you know i think i think it's actually very true i I, i'm right now i'm working on a book on the nature of authority and i'm I'm connecting authority to beauty and it it seems to me that the um uh, a sense of um you know in in england you have a very different sense you've just recently or not so long ago undergone that you know the coronation of charles charles the third you, you see how the pageantry that that involved and the the fact that that um uh it was so f- filled with uh saturated with symbolic um realities f- you know physical things that that represented something and that had a certain beauty a certain sort of glory i mean that that it seems to me that that um, that that actually sets the uh, sets the tone for a nation. It it really does give a kind of a an ethos to to uh, to a nation. And and you know even if you don't have a king like in the U.S. here, um, we can't help but uh, you know the inauguration ceremony. We can't help but give the the kind of founding act of political authority um, a. a kind of a symbol rich beautiful expression because i think that that actually does bear on our um the 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 substantiality uh, of of life that unfolds ah this is very interesting because say yeah whether it's like uh the king or Mm -hmm. president or even religious rituals and ceremonies right, you could right. think that are they just irrelevant ornamentations yeah. but when you when you talk about a symbol so the way i understand a symbol for example like hearing john vaveki talk about how it's it's not just it's not just something like an, an addition but something which actually pulls us and right. calls us to something more than it so i'm just maybe it would be helpful if you talked about the difference between symbolic and the diabolic like okay. like what is what are these things doing why why should a these symbolic things matter, you know, and yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, just you know, the etymology. I find I find the etymology so illuminating. You know, symbolic literally means a, a throwing together, symbolain, soon um, uh, a joining together, and and a symbol is something that that um, you know, in the basic sense, it's 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 a it's the joining together of meaning and matter, you might say. Um, but 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 symbols also have a function in our in human existence to, to join people together around uh, 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 meaningful things and and all of our communal life is is in a way ordered around meaningful things um, you know the highest expression of this is the is the common good that 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 joins a community we tend to have an abstract sense of the common good but I think I think we have to have a much more concrete view of it. Um, the etymological opposite of, of the symbolic is the diabolical. Instead of joining together, literally what, what the word means is, is casting asunder, setting apart. And um, I find that really illuminating because I, it, it seems to me that, that increasingly we are populating our, our existence and our fundamental concepts of the world um, with uh, a form that sets us apart and puts us in competition with each other rather than joining us together. Um, and I think, you know, the, the question of beauty arises right here. You know, there's something essentially beautiful about a, a, about a symbol and um, uh, the relationship between beauty and symbol and, and authority, I think, is something that really uh, demands more reflection than it's been given. I think mm. now is the time for it. 
Well, I know you're writing a book on it now, so it's not finished. But <laughs> yeah. I'm interested on the the, the 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 link between authority and beauty because I mean we talked about children and how they're impacted by things like beauty, and I think about even um, apparently. And I see this in my own life. Children, they're attracted to to more symmetrical faces and yeah. like the, like just the way... And we notice it's not just for children, but we give our attention to certain people above others, right? And it's not just the symmetry of a face, but it's, I mean, who do you pay attention to? I think Jordan Peterson talks about this a lot. You know, you can say it's it's arbitrary, and but then attention really is a scarce thing. Yeah. And, yeah. and and I, I, and I... Especially, you know, I was actually someone that's still a student growing up trying to see what kind of person should I become mm -hmm. I'm, I'm trying to be more attuned to like who am I like paying attention to even who am I actually in a way like playing and I, I, I almost take their opinions That's and right. I start like saying things the way they do I'm like wait why am I doing that <laughs> there yeah. are so, some people I do that to and not others and there, there, it's, it, there must there are qualities that I must see in those people that I'm like oh there's something I'm missing you that's know? right. No, no. That's and that's an important experience. I mean, in our in our our sort of natively skeptical culture that we live in, we think that, you know, you need to in order to be free, you need to sort of detach yourself from from influence. But that never really works out that way. I mean, uh, um, there's a connection between beauty and a kind of radiant presence, um, uh, certain people, certain things. I mean, this is why it's actually important to 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 live in, in uh, an area of beauty, that doesn't mean, um, you know, in the bourgeois sense necessarily that things are pretty, but that, that, that there's a, there's a, a sense of, of meaningful order that, that, that embraces us. I mean, that, that affects us, um, but that affects us in, a, in a, an especially direct way with particular people, as you point out. And, you know, if you think about um, the great artists and musicians um, you know, the painters are, are taught in order to, to become a great painter, you first try to imitate the masters. You know, you find, you find uh, a, a particular great painter that you admire and you try to do what that person did. I mean, and the, the creativity becomes a kind of a natural outflow to the extent that you genuinely enter into the spirit of the master. You actually are liberated into your own Kind of creative powers it's not a, it's not a competition it's not a fight and i think that that's true in terms of education generally we you know imitate the masters um we 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 you know having a role model is is profoundly important i mean that's a, that's such a kind of cliched term but it's profoundly important in becoming mature human beings mm. because i i would suppose in our culture today we think that to get yeah, to, to be free to become our true self we need to try and um, i mean yeah we, even like in i, I mean I, I do economics and just thinking about like even like we have to have the, the things we buy the clothes we wear and everything has to be we need to be our own unique individual um and that that makes sense but also like from what i'm hearing here and as, as we talk it makes me think that actually like sometimes you you become more free by taking uh, almost you know because you because as you say you change yourself if you take qualities That's and right. you learn from the way someone else is doing that so in a way I, what i'm thinking is that maybe that gives you capacities and you know genuine skills to be more free and okay. strangely paradoxically more yourself mm. yeah. no no that i mean i mean we all know that is it you know is it the case i mean think about like again i, I keep coming back to the you know raising children but I mean, is it the case that the child that was never, you know, uh, uh, hugged by uh, parents has always sort of kept it as a distance? Is that the child that ends up growing up to be independent and free? I mean, uh, mm. no, that, that, that's the child that becomes plagued by insecurities and is always attaching in disordered ways to people. The one who's been embraced from the beginning actually has the most sense of freedom. And I think analogously that that gets expressed. This is this is why, you know, it's it's not just um, I'm not saying that imitation is freeing. I, I, I'm saying that um, we want to emulate genuinely good and true and beautiful human beings. So we, we, we actually it really is crucial if you, if you simply are, are following a manipulator. That's a very different thing from emulating uh, someone with virtue, you know, in the 
classical Greek sense, virtue just means excellence. We tend to think of it in just moral terms, but it means just excellence. If we, if we actually, um, uh, in a way, fall in love with the excellence of, a, of, a, of someone further along in the path of life, that spontaneously generates uh, personality and substance and independence and character um, uh, in, in, the, mm. in the disciple, to use the classical language. Right, because you don't need to fall in love with the, the superficial parts of them. You, you, right. if, you, if you're falling in love with and taking the excellent parts of them, then, then again, it makes me think about things like love and beauty as being transcendental, as being beyond us. The, in a way, there's a similarity between everything that is beautiful, everything that is true. Yeah. So, so yeah, and that's why that's maybe why we can see in other people that because there is this relation between them. Um, so it's not like this. It's because it's it's weird though. I mean, it's so then it's in a way, even if it's their excellence, it's in them. It's not really theirs. Maybe yeah, it's, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, that's right. That's actually very insightful. I am. Uh, yeah. I mean, this comes back to the truth question. The, the the truer something is, the more you can actually appropriate it without it ever becoming your property. And and your appropriating of something that's genuinely true simultaneously, and this is why it's symbolic in the etymological sense, simultaneously connects you to other people. It, 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 it makes you more accessible to others and available to others. Um, and I think goodness and beauty are the same. Those are all essentially symbolic realities rather than, you know, we, we have diabolical substitutes for all of them. Um, but the symbolic reality is always to be uh, pursued. And this, and this makes me think that if there, if there is a, if there was a truth that like only we could hold by ourselves, like maybe that could be something that could occur, but that would almost then it would be less true because it would be less universal and yeah. also it would kind of tear us again it would to, to to the degree that if we're less virtuous if we're like less excellent in a way we're kind of torn apart like if we just think about this in your own life if 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 you like are just worse at emulating what is good and you have disparate um drives and passions that like it's not that if they're not united um yeah. then they they kind of they they're just idiosyncratic and then the kind of, yeah, in a way less. That's right. I mean, and that's, you know, the, the, the etymological word for that is the diabolical and that's mm -hmm. being torn apart. That's what that means. And what's, what's so interesting is um, to the extent that um, uh, something is not genuinely true, good or beautiful, it will have the, the, the effect of setting us at odds. Uh, first of all, with ourselves. I mean, that's the, that it's not like, um, you know, we think that, uh, again, we tend to fall into this false dichotomy. I, I need to either live for myself or live for others. But those always go together. <laughs> you find if you're not living for others, then you're going to be, in fact, fundamentally at odds also with yourself. You're going to be torn apart. Mm. Um, uh, uh, and and to, to join with others is to join, you know, body and soul together and, and, and the, you know, the mind and being and ultimately with God. I mean, this is where God comes in, but that's a whole other chapter. <laughs> in in trying to say in our world today, make ourselves like an individual self that can like exist beyond and without others. So this is something you talk about in your book, Freedom from Reality. And I just I think it's just very related because it's it's fascinating that people say in, in like the political universe at the moment would have the conception that um freedom is something when we just allow ourselves to do whatever we want mm -hmm. and just give ourselves like the maximum opportunity to do that to enact our will yeah. and i i love it if you would be able to ex explain and explore yeah. how we might change our conception of yeah. what freedom is right right i mean we we, we tend to, to associate freedom with a kind of separation and detachment you know you need to sever links uh and bonds in order to be free and that, that, again, you know, to use the word that to, to my mind is a, is a diabolical substitute. You find that to the extent that you identify freedom with this separation from um, any claims being made 
on us by others um, or responsibility for others, it always ends up to being a kind of self undermining sort of freedom. And, and true freedom is, is something that's acquired precisely through profound connection and commitment and unity. Um, you know, the freedom of a, of a great, I mean, you know, the classical example, the freedom of a great pianist is one who has entered deeply into the, in a disciplined way into the art. Um, and, and, you know, that requires a kind of a commitment. It, it puts all sorts of constraints, but the, the, the more fully you enter into those, the more possibilities open up, genuine possibilities. And I think that's a, that's a, that's a metaphor for life. Um, the more deeply we, we enter into the relationships that are already there, that we already find ourselves in, um, the more freed we become to be ourselves. Interesting. Um, I mean, one thing I wanted to explore since we've been talking about, about many things, but the nature of truth is, yeah. is still something. And so, so Plato talks sometimes about truth as being most difficult to get to like suffering and yeah. you talk about there about discipline like yeah. to become our true self i mean you think that surely it would just be it might just be about uh, taking in pleasures and just doing things that make us happy and good but then that discipline and that hardship if that can bring us out bring out of us something that is more true to ourselves um that and, and i'm just fascinated by the way yeah, the plato has a great great phrase i'm not going to quote any of it now but just that um, you kind of have to love the battle for truth. Like it's not yeah. easy to get, um, but to, but if you want to see more into reality, it's you're going to have to grapple with it. You know the proverb that that Plato quotes many times. It's actually he says, uh, "Beautiful things are difficult. Mm. Beautiful things are challenging." It's, it's, he associates beauty. It's kind of interesting, but I mean, for him, it would be inseparable from from truth and, and goodness. But that that is the point. I mean, if we find ourselves um, simply responding in a kind of an immediate automatic way to um, uh, the, the most intense and superficial um, demands for gratification. We all, I mean, all of us have done that, first of all, I presume. I mean, I certainly have. Um, uh, and, but we all, I think, have the experience insofar as we do that kind of thing that we're, we're drifting. You know, that's, it's, it's, it's interesting. You, you feel yourself adrift dissolute you know the the words that we use your your your, your personality is kind of getting um uh eroded uh and you 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 cease to really know who you are i mean it's, a, it's such an, an amazing thing so that, that's why in a way this it's, it's not even right to call it selfish because the self is is dissolving in that um uh it's it's a kind of um uh, dissolute, dissolute. I mean, I, I think that's such a great word there, uh, way, way of living. Um, even though it's the easiest and, and, you know, it's, it's, it's what, it's the, the, uh, the, the most facile, um, the, the opposite requires, um, uh, you know, a kind of attentiveness, certain discipline, a focus, um, a willingness to, to suffer a patience. Patience is such a great word here uh, to, to, to undergo and to suffer I mean those, those are all but I mean you know the, the, the whole tradition east and west uh, tells us that that there's no other way to achieve wisdom except along those paths I I mean this, this is a, a comment that's not necessarily like directly related to your work but I just I like how you talk about when we say just pursue pleasures in the moment that that kind of yeah t tears us apart and we're less ourselves and i'm just very interested in that trying to be attuned to the feeling of of that because you can you know it it should as you kind of point out the dichotomy it should should and kind of does feel good but it also doesn't because you can kind of feel yourself yeah. um going in different directions and you don't have that purpose and yeah. and then i think about sometimes in a way discipline and and work and the things which which bind you more together and almost pull your spirits together to a unified end that it's not it's not necessarily like it's just a different i'm just it's just almost a different feeling yeah. um and, and more than the feeling is there a better word for that and then that becomes not like the easiest thing but that almost that becomes more natural and yeah. then in a way things that are more difficult become more natural yeah. so even though 
right. you sh it should be more difficult to do. Um, because things are binding together, it makes it easier. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's important not to idolize suffering and say that the more suffering, the better it is. I mean, that's not at all the case. Um, uh, the, the, the desire ought to be aimed at what's true, good, and beautiful with the recognition that that will often in, entail a certain kind of work. But as you say, I mean, this is part of the, the, the classic um, effort at, at education and developing virtue and character. You know, the, the, the more you, and you know, the piano player example that I gave, the more you do it, the, the more natural, it becomes a kind of a second nature. But, you know, it, it, it um, it's, it's interesting when we ask about like what makes us happy um, you know, if we if we ask that, the time frame is is really important. You know, we 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 tend to if you think about it just in terms of your immediate experiences, um, uh, you you tend to be content contented with just Im immediate senses of gratification. But if you were to sort of step back and ask someone, you know, what what are the things that you've done in your life that you're happiest about? You know, you you won't have you'll never have someone who who logs the uh, hours playing video games, you know, that person wouldn't say, this is what I'm happiest about in my life is these, these hours playing video games. You'll, you'll mention some achievement or some relationship or some, you know, and, and, you know, maybe in the moment that was difficult um, and required a kind of, a kind of work. But when you, when you look at it in this broader perspective, it's actually precisely what, what makes you feel best about yourself. Hmm. Interesting. The time frame is really important. Right. Right. And it's and it's so hard to to try and almost identify yourself with that that person iterated over the future. Um. And you know, we talked off the air about how so I, I do economics and how mm -hmm. you know uh, economists might grapple with questions of like, oh, how much do people discount the future? How much are they related to your to a self beyond them and i just find it very interesting to think philosophically what do they you know mean by that like they even debate you know are there different selves yeah. you know is there is there one in the future that's different from the one you are now um and I, I wonder what you think about that um that we can have in a way a disconnect from yeah. the person that we will be in the future like it's it, it's yeah. very funny that you can even have the sensation of like <laughs> i'm really gonna regret this um, and <laughs> I think, I think it was Homer yeah. Simpson made the yeah. joke of like, I really, I really don't want to be, you know, me tomorrow or something yeah. like this, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, that, that's, that, that's actually a pretty interesting phenomenon. I, the, 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 the nature of time in relation to human experience and human identity. I mean, that, that's a profoundly, uh, important and, and interesting topic i mean we, you know we don't really have time to get into the, the depths of it but just I, you know i think um uh as human beings we're naturally uh i you know we we tend to say that we're, we're creatures of time we, we live in time and that's that's true but that's only part of the truth actually we're, we also there's a part of the human being that transcends temporality um and and it's it's crucially important to recognize that because that um, our our existence is not simply temporal. We we live in the kind of intersection of time and eternity. I mean that's what constitutes proper human human existence. And obviously to explain what all that means and prove it that 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 requires more more time than we have. Uh, but uh, but it's something worth thinking. Yes. No. Maybe next time we could discuss some kind of, these kind of topics because there's just so much in, in your work, and I've I really enjoyed this. So, um, do you have any last words? And where can people find your work? Um, oh, find my work. I don't know. But last words. I I really enjoyed this conversation. It was it was uh, it was one of the the more uh, kind of reflective and 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 genuinely f philosophical. So I, I appreciate it and thank you for for uh, inv inviting me on. Um, and I look forward to, yeah, possibly. Thank you. Talking yeah, I'll, and I'll, I'll link some of your books that I've mentioned uh, in the description so people can find some of your work that way. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you.